those fields anymore because they show. Well, I could tattle on Bob. I mean, he had a. I'm going to ask him how his six pack of Coors Light in his car was that day. He's tattling on me this morning. <laughs> well, we'll get started in about five minutes. Yeah. You want me to start my clock? Oh, well, you can, but this is happy camp, so, you know, plus or minus. <laughs> uh, How was your Coors Light? I gotta tell you, after, after all, well being God does nice. some great work. Doesn't he, though? Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. You know, this you morning well it was cloudy oh, okay. and a little overcast, and oh, okay. it was still very beautiful, even though the clouds were in oh, yeah. this morning. And now it's kind of cleared off and still nice, mellow. Great, great work. Not 105. But then again, you've got to think of how long he's been doing this. You know. He has been doing it a little while, yeah. In, in spite of the fact that we messed it up. Continuously. Uh, yeah, it's, it's beautiful here. Like, oh, sure, what you should say. Uh-huh. It's a good thing that he's a patient God, because if I were God, we'd be in trouble. No kidding, huh? Very patient. roof. So it's got to be pretty sturdy. Anyway, sure, what every once in a while we'd come up with that. When he was arguing with. A little Something Kelsey from the Jehovah's Witness. Uh huh. Well, you know, I'm not so sure of that word God's best work. <laughs> it does make you wonder, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, he and Will used to go at it pretty yeah, when I got done. It was like, <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, Gross. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> doing that, you can drink, drink like four it, liters yeah. a day of water. I bet, yeah. And uh, even doing that, that, that's not enough. I know. Well, it's like you're not hiking. Oh. How much water can you drink? <laughs> I know. It was written. When I was logging, I take two gallon jugs of water, and it was barely enough to make it through the day. I know. Yeah. You gotta so stay hydrated. Two, two <laughs> gallons. Two gallons. Yeah, yesterday the lenticular clouds when this system Did you see those lenticular they were amazing. They were everywhere. So, the wind must have been just so, screaming up there. Well that and just the instability that comes when you know that's coming and you're like, okay. We got some serious issues going on somewhere. That's a pretty good wind gust. <laughs> yeah, we did. We celebrated Cade's birthday with his friends at the park yesterday. Oh, okay. Well, I can remember that. Abig- uh, like uh, like uh, and sometimes you have headwinds of 150 and 160 knots. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of wind. That's a lot of wind, yeah. yeah but Abby wanted me Not to set up the tent, and I said, oh, why, times. you're going to fly a box yeah. kite? <laughs> Yeah. Put it on a heavy line. <laughs> we stake that thing down pretty good. Yes. It makes, it makes your air speed yeah, good. Yeah. You know, it's nice and ground speed this morning. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> when I got my trailer, I put the awning out. And it's about this far from the back of the building. And I stop it. And the building blocks all the wind. So I got that shape. I don't have to worry about rocking it in and out. Oh, that's good. It's really oh, nice. Oh, yeah. oh, it's Helicopter. <laughs> oh well. Happy birthday! 
He's going down the, the, the runway, and all of a sudden, that, that uh, jet truck just exploded in a ball of fire. Oh, man. Really? Yeah. Not a lot of fuels oh, those things run is not a good way so to volatile. To no, not really. <laughs> oh, that's for sure. You don't sell many tickets like that. Oh, I like the race I saw one oh, oh. in July or I went to Moffitt Field in the Bay Area. Moffitt? And they had just come out with that, what, uh, what is it, Crusader or whatever, the, the, the canopy for the nose to yeah. tilt it down. So anyway, he was going to take off and fly to San Diego and turn around and come back. And the other plane he was competing against was a Curtis Pusher that mm. was going to make 10 laps around the airport. That jet got back before that Curtis Pusher made all 10 laps. <laughs> yeah. Well, how fast does Curtis Pusher go? Yeah. Just I enough to stay in the air. <laughs> I flew on that plane twice. Well, once over, once oh, okay. back. Um, they grounded them, they, they stopped. Yeah, stopped. Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, depends on what's going on, huh? <laughs> Well, let's pray and we'll get our day started. Father, thank you so much for this day. It is a beautiful day. And Father, we're here to worship you and just to thank you for the freedom that we have in you. Lord, on this 4th of July weekend, we think about those who established the United States based upon your laws and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we pray that even in the midst of very difficult things, Lord, that people would still look to you, still trust in you, knowing, Lord, that you are the answer. So, Lord, we thank you once again for this time and the ability to meet in your name. Amen. Amen. Well. <clears throat> On Christ the solid rock.
dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of On Christ's solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, all of the ground is sinking sand.
stop, never stop working, even when I don't see it in your work, even when I don't feel it you working, you never stop, never stop working, never stop, never stop working. His promises us to us, and we know that His promises to us are yea and amen. That means it's a guarantee when He makes it. Now, I might make you a promise, but there's a, there's a chance that I might break that. <laughs> I try not to. glad for his mercy. Oh, there's a place
certain terms, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And Father, we are so grateful that you did leave the 99. A lot of times that doesn't make sense. It's just one sheep. But Father, <clears throat> you find us so valuable. And even though we don't understand that, we certainly appreciate that. And because of that love that you have for us, and that even while we were sinning against you, you died for us. Father, we are here this morning just to say thank you. And that we love you. And that we're going to continue to just walk with you all the days of our life. So Father, may we continue steadfastly to do the job that you have set before us. In sharing your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, it's been an interesting week, to say the least. So let's get to our prayer request. <coughs> so, kind of the usual standing requests for Operation Christmas Child. Continue to pray for that ministry, um, our nation, um, and uh, also, of course, the, the peace of Jerusalem. Continue to pray for that. Things are uh, getting a little kind of crazy out there, but the Lord said that would happen before he came back, so... Um, we're definitely feeling the, the birth pain, I guess you could say, um, as he would state in his word. So continue to pray for our, our government, those in leadership over us, as well as uh, just the communities here and the folks that we deal with regularly for their salvation. Um, and in that, remember Jean and John uh, specifically. Um, other prayers... Uh, for cancer, Jim, Dory, um, of course, some of you already know that Larry Gabbert uh, is now with the Lord. No more pain, no more suffering, none of that. And of course, we would love to be there as well, um, in a sense, but we still have a job to do. Larry's is done. And, uh, you know, I got to hand it to guys like Lou and Bob who went over there and just ministered to him in those, those last few days that he had, just, you know, kind of being with there and assuring him. Um, it's not an easy job to watch people move from this life into the next. But uh, when you and I get to join in, not just in prayer, but also personally to sit with them and pray with them and, and sing and play music and things like that for them, man, the transition into heaven is just from that to something unbelievable, you know, so uh, um, continue to pray for those that are uh, affected by, by that loss um, for us here. Uh, continue to pray for Frank um, in his cancer and Bert in his cancer. Also pray for Frank because um, with permission from Frank, he said, it's okay to talk about me. <laughs> um, uh, he's got COVID. And uh, he had to uh, fly out the other day. Um, and I was dealing with my own issue. Um, I had, uh, I think just the day before, uh, been dealing with um, some uh, irritation in my right eye. And uh, it, it kind of started after my um, loving granddaughter brought me some flowers 
um, that she picked out of the lawn and down by the, the river. And, and I pinched off one of the long stems and thought, oh, I better wash my hands. Uh, that way I don't get it in my eyes. And you know how uh, you feel like the Lord just told you to do that and then you ignore it? Well, and then I put my hand in my eye and then both of my eyes started itching really bad. Well, by that evening it was pretty significant. And the next day, um, it was a little sketchy driving out the river road. But anyhow, um, I did it, okay? Um, I don't believe that I ran over anybody, but anyway. So that long story oh, well. short, they said that I had um, either allergies or conjunctivitis, viral or bacterial, so they gave me some special drops, which I had to wait like hours to find in Wairika. Um But I'll tell you what, boy, even after just a day of that, it was wonderful. But that was was right when I got that, I'm not supposed to touch anybody or any of that. Plus, I'm not supposed to wear my contacts. Well, I don't have glasses, so I couldn't really go on the call for Frank and take care of him. So Charlie and, uh, and Heather ended up caring for him and uh, then flying him out to Medford. And so Frank got some treatment, and then they sent him home. But even as Jody said, um, you know, she's good about <coughs> updating me on his condition, that he's he's kind of fighting a, a bit. It's not easy um, getting through COVID, especially being that he has that immunocompromised situation because of cancer. So keep praying for him and pray that, uh, that the Lord would just uh, touch him, heal him. Um, there is a lot of COVID going around, not just here, but also Medford area is just, it is what it is. We're, we're going to be uh, stuck with COVID for quite some time. So keep praying for, uh, for Frank and for healing there. So other uh, medical and health-related and uh, other issues, um, Jimmy with back problems, any improvement there? No. No? Poor guy. Uh, Dolly? One and two. Uh-huh. Well, can't let life stop you, I guess, in a sense, right? Go have fun. <clears throat> give me fishing or give me death, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so keep praying for Jimmy. And then Dolly with um, knee problems and, and issues there. Uh, Buster uh, for help. Um, pray again for the fire guys for for service and those kinds of things. Um, they are all on 24 hours um, a day uh, situation right now because of course it's 4th of July but God in his mercy is going to send a little rain and cool it off and so hopefully that will um, keep us from uh, burning the place down. So uh, <clears throat> continue to pray for, for those needs. Um, Stan in Virginia uh, for their health. Uh, my dad doing pretty good right now. Uh, Denny and Donna who were going to come down for um, Kate's birthday party yesterday. Um, and they got almost to Collier's rest area, and uh, their truck broke down. And they ended up having to wait like four or five hours for a tow. So, um, Especially they could go you know, and get out of the rain. <laughs> yeah, well, and it was nice that there's, you know, a rest area there and a bathroom and, you know, things like that. So. If you're going to break down, at least break down in a good spot. So, um, But keep praying for, for that um, situation as well as their medical needs. Um, Judy, Judy Peabody's mom for help. Uh, Terry Everett, the same. Um, Steve and Fran Smith um, because of the ALS. Uh, Candace with lupus. Um, Debbie Taylor, how's your mom doing? I'm sorry? She still needs to. Still needs prayer, so yeah, keep praying there. And Dan Bushy and his continued medical. Uh, Christopher um, with the situation with his wife in Ukraine. Uh, Brenda Franklin and her continued improvement. Um, uh, as far as ministries go, you've got the Clapper Church. Um, you've got the uh, Vacation Bible Schools that are going on. Um, the Navigators Group. But then also um, this week I posted a, um, a photo of my dad and I at the beach 
and uh, uh, one of uh, the, the pastors who has a unique ministry to a over 70s group of surfer guys that he uh, tries to reach out to um, uh, invited me to join his group and I did and I posted that picture there and uh, um, he said hey could you continue to pray for this group of folks so um, it was amazing a lot of response on that particular post and I said well dad I'm just going to have to keep putting your picture in there with all of my posts because it gets a lot of attention so <laughs> so makes them feel good because when they say things like um, well which one is which either I look really old or he looks really young for his age and it's 78, I, I'll, I'll choose to make him look younger versus me look older. So anyway, um, but uh, continue to pray for that uh, over 70s uh, surf ministry there. So um, there are a couple more here. Uh, Jean, uh, Dory's um, cousin with strokes. Um, uh, Vicky's sister-in-law, Joni. Still waiting to hear. Okay. Okay. So, uh, with that that situation with the cancer, there continue to pray for that. Um, Mark with uh, diabetic um, issues, um, and then a good uh, friend of ours, Jimmy Corson, which is uh, my pastor John's brother. Uh, he not only has COVID, but he's also got some issues uh, with his kidneys. So. Um, they're asking for prayer uh, for him um, as well. And uh, Abby used to go to his church when she was in Newburgh. Yeah, yeah, they're up there, and I think they are still in Newburgh um, and whatnot. So, got a, a nice small little church up there uh, that they uh, are still ministering to. Um, and then, of course, Heather's not feeling good today, so keep her in your prayers as well. So. And uh, other prayer requests, things that you need to bring up. So, sorry, David, Robin, brought, Robin beat you to the time. So, go ahead. Um, is, is everything okay with Larry Gabbard's family? And the kid he's had? Yes, we talked about that. Yeah. So, we'll keep praying for, uh, for him and those that have experienced loss for sure. So, David. So, my dad turned 80 on Friday, and yesterday was his 80th birthday. Um, last weekend, my niece and nephew treated him to a Giants game, and he was actually on national TV with a with his you know, sign. 80 yeah. years old, been a fan for this long. Um, unfortunately, somebody there did not take proper precautions, and so he actually brought COVID back with him. And he was he tested positive. My mom tested positive, and some other family members. So his surprise birthday party was surprise. actually canceled. Oh. People that were going to be coming from, you know, like one from the East Coast and a bunch from Oregon and everything, we had to cancel the whole thing. And so it's like he's. It was like a bucket list item for him to be on national TV at the uh -huh. Giants game. But he also feels like extremely guilty, and he's one that, you know, he kind of feels like he ruined everything, you know. So just keep him in prayer, because he didn't ruin everything, because, you know, I mean. Unless he created that virus. He did not. And he did not. So just so. keep him in prayer. And, I mean, they're on the backside of it. Right. Everything's, I mean, they're feeling fine. That's good. Family members are feeling fine. My brother came up from the L.A. area and kind of figured, Gosh, I wasted a plane trip. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. so just keep them in prayer. Definitely. Definitely. So, Bob? Uh, I saw Dolly this morning. She and uh, her grandson, I guess, were headed over to the coast for the night show tomorrow night or whatever. Anyway, she asked for a travel prayer. Okay. Uh, yeah, the other thing is, uh, and you already mentioned it, and that's keep Larry's family in prayer. Definitely. Uh, his ex-wife's been just fabulous here taking care of him and so forth. And I guess his son and wife are coming with a U-Haul shortly. And, but anyway, they'll need prayer for safe travel. And, yeah. Yeah. 
I have the hymn book too that's white. That's really cool. I know. She came out and took care of town. Yeah. And didn't let any of that other stuff get in the way. Yeah. I can't imagine doing life without the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, what a bummer. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. One more one more quick one. Um, somebody donated a large sum of money or a decent sum of money to Clapper Church to provide Bibles for those that mm-hmm. don't have them. Wow. And they're a special study Bible, you know, that uh, one of our staff is uh, sending out. And we come to the end of those funds. So just keep that ministry in prayer that the funds will keep on coming in as people request them. Sure, absolutely. Right now, some of us are out of pocket. Regina. Yeah, this is on traveling mercies. We're getting a lot of red flags throughout the summer. And then with the COVID, uh, I'm considering going to see my daughter and the the baby and all later this summer. Um, And then last time we got all hit, but it wasn't COVID. But it wasn't COVID, yeah. Hey, you know, we're family. You got to share, right? <laughs> Some things you don't want. So I'm going to pray for the cheap flight. I'm going, I'm going there myself. Okay. Anybody else? The plane doesn't get canceled. Huh? The plane doesn't get canceled. Any other requests? Okay. And if you're tuning online... Leave your request there. We will pray for those. So let's let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for um, just the opportunity that we have to lift up these that are in need. What a what a joy it is to be able to come alongside and minister to them in this way. Whether it's our government or COVID ministries, Operation Christmas Child. Um, whatever it might be. Lord, for those that are sick with cancer, those that have suffered loss, Lord, we all have needs, and you are Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. And this morning, Lord, we just ask that you would provide an answer in each situation. Lord, where there is need for hope, bring it. Where there is need for salvation, Lord, we ask that you would open the eyes and the hearts of those uh, that, that really need to hear and have that, that hope that's found in you only. <clears throat> Lord, for those that are dealing with continuous medical, we pray, Lord, that you would comfort them, that whatever doctors or nurses or medication can be brought their way to help them along in that. Uh, that would be wonderful. But, Father, we pray for healing in those situations. Father, we are so grateful that we can present these to you and that you hear from heaven and that you respond. Father, help us to be faithful throughout the week to remember these in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, <coughs> Bible studies, uh, the men's prayer breakfast, 7 a.m. at the Bible Church. Bill's Pancakes. Bill's Pancakes. There you go, guys. And uh, the women's Bible study, Thursday at 10 a.m. Um, I don't have any information yet on the evening um, situation there, uh, also at the Bible Church. So, ladies, you are welcome to join in there. And then, of course, continue to pray for our Sunday school and our youth group as David opens up his home on Wednesday night for Bible study at 6 o'clock and swimming when the weather is decent and uh, ministry to our junior high and high school kids. So, um, and then Robin's with the little ones. So, um, birthdays. Regina. I can see you kind of hearing back there, but hey, you're on my list. So, Regina has a birthday. Also, um, this week, um, Alex. My son has uh, a birthday, and uh, he tunes in frequently when he has the opportunity. So, uh, and then Judy Bushy, you have a birthday. So, and then Emma. Emma, how old are you going to be, Emma? How old are you going to be? Twelve. Twelve. 
my goodness. You look so much older. No. I know at that age you kind of like that. But when you start getting up this end, you're like, no, no. Let's reverse course and go the other way, right? So, anyhow. She's like right here at me right now. Yeah. So let's uh, sing and wish them all a happy birthday. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Regina, Alex, Judy, and Emma. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And to Jesus be true. May God bless you and keep you your whole life through. And many more. All right. Again, pray for the peace of Israel. Um, I don't really have an update for you. Things are uh, pretty much status quo, uh, as we talked about last week. And I don't know, there's a lot of positioning going on. Um, and a lot of things that are going on over there that are in a very defensive uh, type mode. And um, I know the elections aren't going to be in October. They've pushed them back till. Um, I think after our election, so into November. So keep praying for them. We'll see what happens. And uh, should the Lord tarry, that um, they would get some good and righteous leadership. So, Well, at this point, we will dismiss the kids. And the rest of us can turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to talk about a workman's wage. Many years ago, I was, oh, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years old, there was a, uh, a church a couple of doors down, which was a little bit of a walk uh, for me, but they had kind of a traveling type um, pastoral leadership, and um, there wasn't a whole lot of people around that area when we lived out there in Sam's Valley. It was more like living on uh, out in Little House on the Prairie. I and mean, it just it was a long way to everything. And there was not a lot um, in Medford even at that time. Uh, so the Rogue Valley was very quiet. Um, I remember the airport uh, had just kind of a little, you know, um, kind of a, a U shape. Uh, hanger that you would kind of walk through a little turnstile that counted and then you would just walk out onto the, the hard deck and get in your plane. Um, it wasn't much of anything going on really in Medford other than some logging and uh, things like that. Um, and boy how things change. But I can remember in a particular instance um, I had walked down see the new um, pastor for that church that was, again, um, what in our area would be a couple houses down. Um, and they had a little travel trailer that they had set up kind of out in back of the church. And, and I said, hey, can, can I help uh, cut some weeds down? And of course, I didn't really have um, a lawnmower or anything. I had those hand clippers that you just squeeze over and over. And um, she was gracious enough to tell me, yes, I, I would love that if you would go around our trailer. And, and uh, so I painstakingly trimmed out all of those weeds out from under um, their travel trailer. And I, it's, it took me a, a while. Uh, and when I got done, she came out and looked at the job and said, good job. And handed me, I couldn't believe it, a $2 bill. And I was thrilled. I thought, man, I can get a lot of candy for, for, uh, for this money. And uh, so I went home and um, rejoicing, I came in the front door and I said, Mom, look at how much money I made. 
and my mom said, oh, that is just, that's just too much money. You need to take that back and tell her that's too much. Um, you should have, you should have been able to do that for 50 cents. And uh, so I took it back um, begrudgingly, and <laughs> and I said, oh, my mom said that it's that's just too much, and I, only 50 cents. And she gave me 50 cents and took it back and understood what my mom was trying to do. And anyhow, um, even though I was very frustrated at that, I still went and bought the candy that I wanted anyway. But, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, I worked hard, and I was rewarded for that. Paul has been dealing with a church that is very young in the Lord, a church that uh, he started in his ministry there in Corinth, trying to minister to people that were into idol worship and things of that nature. There were so many idols in that town that, as you recall, they even had one set up to the unknown God. So Paul had worked kind of painstakingly to really get this church going and keep them moving. And over the last several chapters, he's been talking to them about works and things that they should be doing for the Lord. And now when he uh, begins to talk to them after speaking with them, as we looked at last week, about eating food uh, that was offered to idols and, and things of that nature, that it's not wrong to eat or not to eat. Um, but we have to be careful about those that are younger in the Lord and how that might affect them. And so as we get into chapter 9 and Paul continues to address some of their questions, uh, he starts it with a question of his own. And uh, the title of today's is A Workman's Wage. Well, <clears throat> Paul says here in verse 1, Am I not free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think uh, I am not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. So he deals with this issue of being a pastor, an apostle, a, a teacher of the word. And he brings up questions that we can obviously understand what the people or some of the people might have been asking. Well, Paul, you're not a real pastor. You're not a real minister of the gospel because you didn't go to... Biola, or you didn't go to, um, oh shoot, I forgot <coughs> some of the ministries, uh, Moody. Moody, or um, um, or Kent Hughes's uh, college. Um, anyway, <coughs> there's some pretty prestigious colleges out there, but here's the thing. You know, the Lord does not differentiate in language in the scripture between the word father, pastor, elder. They're all the same word. So if you are the father of a family, you're the pastor. If you are an elder, then you are, in a sense, a pastor to the youngers. I would say that that is the same way, in a sense, with the women. The women that are older are supposed to teach those that are younger. And, of course, the same is true for a shepherd or a pastor or an apostle. You are called, in a sense, by the Lord to do a ministry. We're all called there in some way to go out and share in the ministry of the Lord. It's just that Paul addresses an issue here that is true leadership question. Well, Paul, you are not an apostle. You, you are not called by Jesus Christ to do these things. Um, yes, and actually I have witnesses. Because while I was going out to kill other Christians, when we look in the book of Acts and we see 
all of that unfold, Paul would say, no, I spoke to Jesus face to face. And there was a bright light. I got knocked on my hind end. And he said to me, Paul, why do you persecute me? Why are you kicking against the goats or those little prongs that would stick out in order to keep the oxen moving in the right direction without getting out of control? <clears throat> why are you asking for a godly spanking all the time? Why are, you, why are you rebelling against that? He said, I spoke to Jesus face to face. And during that time, God told me, this is what you are to do. You are to go and be my minister. You are to go and share the good news. And we know that there were others that were there because they witnessed it. And his eyes were covered, and he had to go and get prayer in order for the Lord to open up his eyes even farther. And even though the others heard the voice, they didn't understand what was being said. Paul did, but that was a message that was directly to Paul. Some in the church of Corinth here were questioning whether or not Paul was an actual called minister of the gospel. Did you know that even though that Paul had an amazing education, probably one of the most prestigious educations, and it shows in a lot of his writings, and, and when he shared with others, he didn't say, well, Peter, you're not really as good as I am because I had a better education. And yet it's sad to see that even amongst pastors. Well, I went here, or I went there, or I studied at this uh, ministry, or under this person. And somehow that makes you better? No. What are we studying? Who are we studying? We are all under the calling of one person, and that is Jesus Christ. In fact, he would say uh, through Timothy, one of Paul's uh, students, that we are to be those who study to show ourselves approved workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of what? Truth. And the only truth that we have is the truth that Jesus has placed in the scriptures. And so it's our job to rightly divide that, which means that those that are called to be pastors and teachers need to study. They need to look into it. It is a job. I have a couple of jobs. Of course, many of us do here in this town. You have to. You have to wear many hats in order to keep the ball rolling, so to speak. And a lot of times those jobs meld together very well. When it comes to being ambulance, it's very conducive for uh, um, my pastoral duties to be able to minister to those that are hurting. Many people will say, well, will you pray for me? Absolutely. And I get to pray with them and I get to minister to them and help them through uh, a time when they are uh, possibly at their deepest um, issue or problem physically speaking, and I get to share that. But also, I get to be here with you guys, and I am proud of you guys for faithfully coming and studying with me as we go chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But here they were really questioning Paul, saying, well, you know, we're just not even sure that you're a true apostle. You know, he says, hey, I am. I am an apostle. I saw Jesus with my own eyes, and he called me to this ministry. If you have a ministry, then you would also have a congregation. <clears throat> Some people say, well, if there's not a lot of people in your body, then just move on. Move on to a church that's bigger, that's better. I would say, no, that's not really the way it goes. Jesus sat with how many disciples? Just 12. Just 12 that were really willing to sit down, to listen to him, to work through their own physical struggles and spiritual battles in order that those 12 might be prepped and ready to go out into all the world 
and preach the good news. Paul would say whether you have, in a sense, a ministry of very few or whether it's large, that is your job. That is where you're supposed to be. I can remember after <clears throat> spending a lot of years at Applegate, many of those on staff, um, that uh, when we came to Happy Camp, it's definitely a different thing. But I can remember Pastor John sitting down with me and saying, now remember, right now you're at Applegate Christian Fellowship. Happy Camp Christian Fellowship is not Applegate Christian Fellowship. They're not going to function the same. They don't have the same needs. They're certainly not going to be the size. I mean, if we invited our whole town to church and they all came out, it's not, it's not I mean, it would be a drop in the bucket of what they had out there at Applegate. So it's going to be smaller. It's not going to be what you're used to. And I can remember seven months into it, we were on the phone. John, hey, this is difficult. This is not what we expected. Can we come back? And I thank the Lord that he said, no, stay and see what the Lord would do. Even as we've talked about earlier in uh, this book, stay right where the Lord has you and see what he would do in each of the ministry areas that you're at. He said in this life you will have what? Tribulation. So is that going to change just because you're in church? No. He didn't say, hey, if you get saved and you go to church, I tell you, the rest of your life is going to be a piece of cake. <laughs> if that were the case, we would have all 900 people in town here, wouldn't we? Because that would just be too easy then, right? But who is the God of this world? It is Satan. And there, there will always be those who question you. There will be those times that you question yourself. Lord, what am I doing here? But there are many times the Lord says, even as we've already talked about in this first book of Corinthians, I want you to stay because that is where I have you in ministry. Stay there, whether it's your marriage, whether you're uh, widowed, whether you're an apostle, whether you're just learning, whatever it might be, I want you to stay. But Paul says the proof is in the workmanship. Paul says, I came, I started a church, and even though I've been traveling around and going um, here and there to the other churches that I started, you are the proof that the Lord is doing something here. And I started that. This is his ministry, but it is also my responsibility. I am the workman that the Lord has placed in your church, in your life. And that's the way it is for uh, me here in Happy Camp. So verse 3, this is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals. Of course, in that day and age, we didn't have the amenities. When you were traveling around, it wasn't like you just tapped into your cell phone and got online and booked a hotel through Travelocity or whatever it might be and say, well, we'll stay in Corinth for a few nights and, and whatnot, and we'll just book a room there. And No, they were reliant upon the body of Christ the people in church to provide for their needs when they would come and minister. So Paul says here, don't we have the right? If we are going to be there and taking all of our time to come and minister to you and teach you and share with you the things of God, then don't we have the right to a wage, in a sense, to even something as small as a place to stay and food to eat? Paul would say, I'm not asking for much. Just a place to lay my head and a meal. Well, verse 5, don't we have the right to bring, or, <clears throat> yeah, don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us 
as the other apostles um, and the Lord's brothers do, as uh, Peter does. So apparently Peter was married as well and traveled around for the ministries that he was involved in. He would bring his wife, which is a little different than what we understand um, in, the, in the Catholic faith. They believe that Peter was the first pope, and you can't be pope if you're married, right? And so there can't be. Peter's married. We also know that Paul was married. We don't know what his marital status is because he doesn't bring it up. But he said, don't we still have the right, the same right, as the others? Now, I don't know about you, but if I had a choice to go to Peter's church or to Paul's church, no offense to Peter, great guy. He's kind of a loud mouth, um, you know, fisherman type, rough and tough and, you know, a man's man. But Paul was just a genius when it came to the word. And I love to discover when I read the Bible. I love to get into it and pull it apart and understand the language. Paul would have been probably my choice. I like to understand that stuff. I really want to know it. But it would seem as though this church gave more authority, in a sense, or put more authority in <coughs> Peter's realm. Well, he was one of the disciples. You weren't. Yes, I am. I was called. I met Jesus. He knocked me on my buns. There were witnesses there. I was blind until um, I was prayed upon and healed. And yes, I am an apostle of the Lord. And you, you, the church here in Corinth, are a witness to those things because I've been teaching you, I've been sharing. If it wasn't a real good ministry of the Lord, it would fold. And Paul said, but you're still here. You're still plugging away. And so we have rights. A worker, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 10, is worth his wage. So when you spend all day clipping weeds under somebody's trailer and they hand you $2, you should be able to keep the $2. <laughs> uh, Sorry, Mom. <laughs> but here's the thing. Where God guides, God what? Provides. Paul would even say, and so would Jesus, that, hey, look, if it's not working out, then just dust off your feet and move on. There's no congregation there. There's no congregation. If people don't want to learn, they don't want to learn. But if there is a congregation there, then the right of the workman, the pastor, is to get a wage, to take something. Well, <clears throat> let's move on. Don't we have the right, the right uh, to bring a wife? If you're going to bring a wife, she's also going to, or family, going to need some provision. Verse 6, or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work uh, to support ourselves? So as Paul was traveling around with Barnabas, we know that Paul uh, was pretty good at making tents. Um, and so they would travel and they would sell their tents or repair them along the way and, and make um, some, some type of living um, in that case. And he would say, or is it just the two of us that have to really, well, if you really are a pastor, then, you know, then that's fine, but um, we're not going to provide for you as, as the church here in Corinth. You just go do your own thing. Go repair tents and whatnot. So it sounds like there was a handful that really, in that church, first of all, didn't want to be there. Because if you were really wanting to be in church, you're going to want to study and show yourself approved. As workmen that need not be ashamed, you're going to be interested in the truth. So if you're not going to church, in a sense, then you're just saying, I'm just not interested. Not interested to know, Lord, what you have to say. And I would say in this particular church in Corinth, they were making a lot of excuses when it would come to the work of the Lord. And Paul would say, look, this is not only my right, but you are my witnesses. Look at what has taken place in this church. Though you're young, you're still moving along and you're still learning some of these things. And those that, of you that question, fine, then ask those questions. And he says, this is who I am. This is what I've done. So, I appreciate questions, 
but you also have to be willing to take the answers that the Lord provides in that regard. Verse 7, <clears throat> he brings up more of an argument in, uh, in favor of his job. What soldier has to pay his own expenses? Yeah, would you sign up for the military if they said, well, you know, yeah, you, you can come and work for the military, but you got to pay your own way. Well, I would say he probably would have a very small army, to say the least. So, um, what farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? Yeah, that would kind of stink. You plant a, a garden and you go out there and there's people guarding the gate saying, uh-uh, no, 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 you don't get any of this food. You don't get any of these veggies or fruit. Well, I planted it. Yeah, but it's mine now. That would seem very strange to us. And that is what Paul is pointing out. What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion, or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Of course, in that day, you didn't just get to flip the switch and the power kicks on and grinds all of your wheat down into, you know, uh, pieces of kernel that can then be ground into flour so that you can make bread. You had to use uh, the labor of an animal. And if they're there, um, trodden out the wheat, then if they bend over and you know, half a bite, or if you've got a bucket there, you should fill it full of something so that maybe it makes it a little more enjoyable. On top of that, they have the right. God put us in charge of the animals, and so we need to care for them. But to put them there and make them do the work for free, Moses would say, that's not fair. God doesn't make you do that. I mean... If you go to eat, you don't have to plant everything that you do. God provided a lot of trees that produce fruit, and you did nothing. Veggies, and you did nothing. So if you don't want to work for free, then you shouldn't do the same to your animals. And so he points this out saying, look, there's got to be an equal there. I'm coming to share with you. You can very easily share some of what you have in a financial uh, uh, way. And so he would go on to say here in verse uh, 10, he wasn't actually, or wasn't he actually speaking to us? Well, yeah, he wasn't talking to the oxen um, because they don't read. And uh, I mean, what's the point? If you're putting it out there for the cows, um, they're not going to have a clue. It's just not fair. So yes, Moses was not speaking um, to the oxen. He was speaking to the people. God is speaking to us, and he uses Paul here to bring up that scripture and that law to say <clears throat> that if, there, if you're going to require work, then there should be some wage. Yes, it is written for us so that uh, the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest and that is only fair verse 11 since we have planted spiritual seeds among you again getting back to that idea of grain we are the ones that did this barnabas and i we have planted this seed among you aren't we entitled to the harvest of physical food and drink is he asking to be a rich pastor is he getting on TV and pleading with his church that he needs his own $22 million plane um, because the Lord has told the church body to give that kind of money so that he can go around and minister quickly to those? Oh, give me a break. You can ride in coach just like anybody else. In fact, that's probably the better way to travel because the person that you might be sitting to or those that are around can be ministered to. 
I don't believe that any pastor should be rich. Not that it's wrong to be rich, but I just don't think that that's what the Lord has really called us to be. The Lord says, I'll provide for your needs. And anything above that is just a blessing from the Lord. But I don't think we need a $22 million plane or whatever it might be, a helicopter to get you from here to there. So, pastors, teachers, parents, dad, let the Lord lead. And where God guides, he what? Provides. And as long as the provision is there, then the calling still remains. So, the Lord would, through Paul here, say, we have a right, we're entitled because of the work that we're doing. It could not have been easy to travel around the way Paul and Barnabas were and some of the other guys that he took along with him uh, to be able to provide. I mean, some of the trips that they went on were, you know, pretty hairy and, uh, and scary to say the, the least. So all I'm asking you is a plate of food and a place to lay my head. If you support others who preach to you, and maybe Paul had um, seen other pastors, maybe Peter had been there, and, and I don't know, it seems like the early church did kind of twist a few things strangely that continue even still to this day in light of how Peter uh, was treated by the Lord and some of the things that he said concerning the Lord. I don't want to get into that so much today, but stick to this ish issues. But whatever pastors were coming around, it would seem as though those were the ones that were uh, ministering, and they appreciated them, but not Paul. Strange. Because a worker is worth his wage. Well, <clears throat> Paul also says, but I've never used this right. I've never asked you for anything. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. He says, look, here's the thing. Though I deserve a wage, I've never asked for one. I didn't ask you to, to, to put food on my plate or give me a place to stay. I just let the Lord lead, and, and we've never asked for that. But you're questioning whether or not I'm a true pastor for your church. Boy, that's got to make you feel good. You go into the church that you started there in Corinth, and they say, well, we, I don't know. I think we, we like some of the other pastors best. You know, that, that can't feel good. Uh, by any stretch. So Paul <clears throat> continues in verse 13. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals um, from the offerings brought to the temple? In the temple, when the priests would make sacrifice, they would enter into the gates. We even sing that song. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And then they would be there at the, uh, at the altar of sacrifice. And they would make those sacrifices to the Lord and pour out the blood. Because without the remission of blood, or without the remission, or without blood, there is no remission of sin. So the people would bring their sacrifices the priests would do all of that, and then they would eat of some of the bread and the things that were provided there, especially the, the high priest that would go into the Holy of Holies. He would be there at the table of showbread after a long day of, of ministering, and yet he had to go further. While the others were outside at the barbecue, you know, he would get to go into the table of showbread, not only praying for that that represents the needs of the people and whatnot. The Lord would also provide him with bread to eat during that time as he continued to minister and to pour out that blood upon the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and on that mercy seat. 
and finish the job that he was told to do. Paul is saying here, look, you know, even those priests got a share in what was happening. So once the, the sacrifice was made, they got to take home some leftover barbecue. Well, in the same way, verse 14, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. If there is any benefit from me, Paul would say, in learning the gospel, in learning the good news, in understanding what God wants your life to look like, in sharing the word, then it would be your duty to, to pay for, for some of that. But he says, I haven't even asked for that. And you're already complaining. I haven't taken anything from you, and yet you're complaining about me. That would be frustrating. Yet I've never used any of these rights, and I am not writing to suggest that I want to start now. Paul says, even though this is the case, because he's again addressing some of the actions of the church and the work that they're doing, but he's also addressing some of the questions in regard to whether or not his authority is realistic or not. Are you a true apostle of the Lord or not? He said, hey, I'm not asking for a paycheck not what I'm doing. I just want you to know that if I am here, that is my right. If I, if I asked for that, then it would be my right, but I'm not suggesting that at all. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without a charge. He doesn't say, I'm doing this because it's a position of pride. Oh, the Lord will provide for me. I hear a lot of people say that often when it comes to some of the issues that they face. And, and I've even seen it where people say, well, here, here is some money or here's um, some food. Or, oh, no, 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 I, you know, I'll, I'll let the Lord provide. You know, we had that big thunderstorm yesterday up north in Medford National. And you see the river of water traveling down through that and I remember the comment the one lady made is like I'm on Noah's Ark <laughs> well not quite but <laughs> it does make you think about the provision of the Lord and how the Lord provides because where he provides he guides look if Paul has the right and he's not asking um, for a, a paycheck but he says I'm also not going to boast about not charging, then for Noah to get on the boat, God loves me more than you. No, I mean, that's not what he's trying to do. He's not trying to make an issue out of something like that. Of course, I lost my train of thought, but I had a really good point in there. So maybe God is not wanting me to go that direction with it. But Paul is saying, look, I, I'm not going to boast about this. I'm not going to brag about not, ta not taking a paycheck. I'm not going to do that. Because what did, he, what did he just get through stating to the people when it comes to food that is offered to idols? Look, it's not right or wrong to eat it or to not eat it. That's not the point. The point that I'm telling you and that you're questioning is, well, shouldn't the rest of the church not be going and doing that? And then the other part of the church saying, well, we're free. We believe in the one true God, so who cares if this was offered to Zeus or Aphrodite or whomever that might be, the unknown God. We can eat it just fine, and it's cheap. It's a cheap steak. Paul would say, you've got you to gotta think a little beyond your own nose. You've got to think about those that are around you and what they need. And Paul says, that's what I'm doing. I am not going to boast about not talking, taking a paycheck from you. What I need you to do is think about those that are around you. Let the Lord lead you. Let the Lord guide you in love, as we talked about last week. And put that same principle here. I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. He's not saying, neener, neener, I 
I am so good and God provides for me all the time that I don't even have to take a paycheck. Oh, that that would be true about some of the people that we see on TV, eh? No. Paul is simply saying, I, I'm not asking for a paycheck, but I would rather die than take one from you if you're unwilling to give it. You know that the Lord says the same thing about your tithes and offerings? When he talks to the people about tithing and offerings, specifically tithing, he would say, look, Israel, my people, my joy, you've ripped me off. Oh, how have we ripped you off? Well, all I asked you to give me was a dime out of every dollar. Yeah, but if I make $2,000 a month, that, that's 200 bucks i got to give away. Yeah, but he also said, even in Joel, that if you do this, I am going to open the floodgates of hell. Or not hell. <laughs> I'm getting distracted because I'm thinking of that thunderstorm <laughs> up there. I'm going to open the floodgates of heaven. And I will stop hell from stealing any of that. I will bless you in ways that you could never be blessed. And I can tell you that there was a period in my life when I was so in debt as a young man wanting to have all the stuff that I looked at what I was tithing uh, to the Lord and I said, wow, that's a lot of money. I can do a lot of fun things with that. And I ended up kind of in a very strange position. I ended up in, in a class, How to Manage Your Money, from God's perspective, uh, not because I wanted to learn how to manage my money, but because the uh, man that was uh, teaching that course um, was a city manager uh, for Medford and did a lot of the finance for them, but he also had a really cute daughter, and I thought, well, if I can get in good with dad, maybe daughter will go out with me, but no, she turned me down every time, and Anyway, but you know what? What I did get? I got to hear the Word of God. And He spoke to my heart. And I can remember going out in my truck and sitting there and saying, Lord, I can put down the numbers and I have only enough money to provide for my needs. There's nothing left because I've racked up all of these bills. And He would say, it doesn't matter. I want you to trust me. I want you to tithe and give me and see if I don't pour out a blessing. Open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. And I can tell you that when I did that in obedience, what happened? It never made sense on paper. But I always had money to not only tithe, but also to pay all of my bills. There were times that my car would keep on running on the same oil that it had had for like two years because I couldn't even afford an oil change. How does that work? Only the Lord. We should never deceive ourselves into when we look at the scriptures and we see what they're telling us to convince ourselves that that is not the truth. If I do it my way, that that's going to be better. It doesn't work. The Lord says, my ways are what? Higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So for me to think that my way is better and that my thoughts are better than God's, that's beyond arrogant. It's just stupid. And God would say through Paul here to this church in Corinth, you, you got to see this differently. I don't want a paycheck from you. God doesn't want your tithe if you don't want to give it. So I'm not doing this to brag, but I'm certainly not going to take anything from you if you don't want to give it. That's for certain. And I'll die before I, I do that and brag to you about uh, my not taking anything from you because I haven't taken a dime from you. So I'm not here for your money. I'm not here for your stuff. I am here to spread 
the truth about Jesus Christ and how he can bless you, how he has blessed you, how he has forgiven you of, of your sins. This is my job, and I am going to boast in that. I'm going to boast in Jesus Christ. And that where he guides, he will provide. So Paul kind of wraps things up here in this chapter. Verse 16, Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. I love God so much and what he's done for me. The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift that Paul had received, unbelievable. And he said, I'm going to boast about that. And I am compelled to share I don't care if you give me a dime. I'm coming here anyway. I love you guys. And I want you to do good, Paul would say in, in Corinth there. And he'd say, I am compelled to do this. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. I'd rather die than not have this ability to share with you. And man, God is so good. If I were doing this on my own initiative... I would deserve payment. I'm not doing this because I'm getting paid. Folks, I am here because I love Jesus Christ with all of my heart. And I want you to understand the same love that I have for him. And I am going to be here. I'm going to share with you. I'm going to love you. You guys are the jewel of my ministry. I'm going to keep plugging away. I don't care if you pay for my stuff or not. I just love Jesus and I want to share I'm going to do this, not for you, not for me, but because I love Jesus Christ and everything that he's done for me. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. He entrusted me with the word, and I am going to share it. What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. And that is why I never demand my right when I preach the good news. Even though I am free, a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. And when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the, the Jews to Christ. And when I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. And even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. And when I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything so that I can save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share the blessings. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? but only one person gets the prize. So if you're going to run, run to win. I like that. Paul says, look, you may see me ministering to this group or that, and that I change things up as I go along. I'm doing that so that those people can get what? Saved. I'm going to minister in whatever way that I can in order to bring the gospel and see those people saved, because that's my job. And I'm going to rejoice in that. Whether I get paid or not, I want people to find their hope in Jesus Christ. If that means I obey the law, wonderful. If it means that I'm with Gentiles and the law means nothing, then I'm going to do that. If I, if I am ministering to those that are weak, then I am also going to put my play in myself in a position of weakness. With those that are strong, then I will be strong. But my job is to run this race that God has set before me, and I'm going to run it. 
I'm going to run it to win. I like that. He's very competitive. Verse 25, all athletes are disciplined in their training, that they do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing, not putting on a show. <clears throat> I'm not fighting things that aren't there. I'm doing this for real. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Not disqualified from salvation, but disqualified for, from blessing. Paul says, I'm going to study, I'm going to share, I'm going to do the things that the Lord has called me to do, and I'm going to do it as though I were an athlete. I'm going to discipline my body. Athletes, there were meals that they wouldn't eat because they were going to to do it in such a way that they would be able to to, um, compete. Wrestlers always confused me uh, because they would starve themselves in order to drop into a weight class once they weighed, which was usually right before their their uh, their meat, then they would maybe try and eat or drink a little something. But they were trying to to be as skinny and as lightweight as possible so that it would have the advantage uh, when it came to getting in the ring. Nah, I was more of a basketball. I liked football and basketball. Hey, I would lose five pounds during the game, but then I would go and eat and eat and eat, try and gain weight, you know, in order to to be competitive. And, you know, hey, athletes put their bodies in positions to be able to win. And Paul would say, if you are called of the Lord, then you need to do the same thing. I myself, he says, I'm going to run to win the prize. Oh, not like it was in Corinth or in uh, uh, Olympus, where they would have the uh, athletic competitions and you would get a little... Um, crown wreath made out of uh, branches and flowers that would, I mean, it's dead the next day. But you got to stand up in front of that crowd. I'm the winner. We still do it to this day, don't we? The Olympic Games and things of that nature. We love competition. And Paul would say, that's me when it comes to sharing the Word of God. Because are we in a competition? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because Satan is here to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. So listen to the word. Understand it. Study to show yourself approved. Trust those that the Lord has put into your life. Whether it's your dad. Whether it's your mom. Whether it's your pastor or an elder in the church, whether it is a friend that is ministering to you, whatever the Lord is doing in your life, just stay right there and see what the Lord would do. And then as he has called you, you also then minister. Don't look for the paycheck. Run a different race. What's the problem with money? Boy, it is here today and gone in five minutes now. Paul would say, run it differently. Do it differently. Do it for the Lord and do it to win. Boy, I bet you if we shared the gospel in that regard, if we could do that, boy, it would only take 12 of us to change Happy Camp, Syed. Hamburg, Horse Creek, Orleans, whatever it might be. When we share the word, share it to win, which means you've got to know the things that the Lord has shared in his word, the hope that he has given to us. And I am proud of you guys for not just continuing to give financially, but to give up your time to study, to show yourself approved. I'm proud of you. I'm proud to be able to be here and do this together as a family. So let's keep plugging away like Paul is saying he is going to do in Corinth and the rest of the ministries that he is called to. Amen? Father, thank you for giving us a job. In a world where we see a lot of people not wanting to work, 
Father, you have called us to a very unique job, one that is the best payment that we could possibly ever have. Father, not only did you give us the gift of heaven, but you said that you're going to give us an abundant life. And I can say, Lord, it has been every bit of that. You have been so good to us. May we continue to preach, share, minister. Lord, we're not looking for a paycheck. We're just going to do this for you. You died. You gave your life for us. And we owe you everything. And even though you don't demand it from us, Lord, you say, hey, if you do these things, I'm going to bless you. And Father, I'm so grateful that you do that each and every day. May we continue to study, to show ourselves approved workmen that are worthy of the wage that you give us. May we continue in joy to share the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week. Enjoy the <clears throat> mild temperatures. Happy 4th of July. May we continue to just share the freedom that we have in Jesus. The freedom away from sin and the hope that we have in heaven. Lord bless you. Amen.